Next, we turn to an amazing scientific breakthrough, the reincarnation of the dire wolf. The fearsome species went extinct over 12,000 years ago. A Dallas-based biotech company, Colossal Biosciences, is behind this new project, and Walter Isaacson speaks to its co-founder, the Harvard University geneticist, George Church, about the implications of this so-called de-extinction. Thank you, Chris John and Professor George Church. Welcome back to the show. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, we woke up this week to headlines that weren't about tariffs or stock market crashes, but something really interesting, which is the dire wolf, kind of made famous in Game of Thrones, uh, after 10,000 years of extinction, has sort of been brought back to life by a company you co-founded. Explain what a big deal that might be. Yeah, uh, we're trying to develop technologies that uh, will help with various conservation efforts um, for uh, prevent, preventing uh, species from um, becoming extinct. And if they, if they just go over the line for a couple of days, not give up on them, maybe bring them back. In this case, it was more than a couple of days. It was more like 12,000 years, but it, you get the idea. So the technologies are based on things like uh, you know, CRISPR and uh, rewilding and uh, sequencing of ancient DNA. When you say it, re it relies a bit on CRISPR, that's the tool that you help pioneer that allows us to cut DNA in very specific places, and eventually you can sort of fix it and change the DNA. Explain how you did that with this, uh, uh, the dire wolf. So uh, more than just cut. So sometimes when you cut, you just make a mess. The these were all very precise. These are 20 very precise edits. And so this is a kind of a, a you know, milestone where we're seeing exponential improvement in our ability to be precise and many of them at once. And, and a lot of the precision is thanks to uh, work from my colleague, David Liu, also a Harvard professor, um, to uh, where you can change one base at a time very precisely. Uh, or we can substitute in big chunks of DNA, which is another thing that we're, uh, we're um, developing. You just mentioned David Liu, the Harvard professor, and he just won the Breakthrough Prize for what's called base editing and prime editing, which means you can actually insert certain genes you want. Did you do that when you tried to recreate the dire wolf? Uh, yes, we, we, we have, um, uh, we're using both base editing and prime editing for various projects uh, at Colossal. And one of the things about it is that you ha haven't really cloned the wolf. Explain the difference between what you did and cloning. Well, so we, we use cloning as part of the process, um, but what we, what we didn't do was, you know, find some ma magical uh, sample where the, where the uh, nucleus of a cell has survived. Uh, instead, what we do routinely for almost all the species that we work on are all the all the ancient uh, DNA that we work on is the DNA is highly degraded and we read it um, with modern techniques into a computer and then from the computer we synthesize it and then put it into a cell and then we will take the nucleus from that cell and move it into an embryo in a surrogate, in this case a uh, dog, um, and, uh, and, then, and then create uh, uh, wolves. Uh, so th it, there is cloning as a little piece of it. Uh, but mostly the, the magic comes from multiplex precise editing. You know, it was almost 30 years ago when Dolly the Sheep was cloned. I remember we put her on the cover of Time magazine. It was gonna be a big deal. How come cloning hasn't really become that big of a deal? Well, I think, I think it's like a lot of things in our life. It is a big deal, but just nobody notices it. Um, so, so for example, we use cloning to also create uh, pigs for which are uh, uh, compatible with human transplants. Uh, the most recent transplant patient was, was a kidney uh, done at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital um, January 25th of this year. So, so this, that, that's due to cloning as well. And there, and there are many agricultural uses as well. So it, it, it's a real thing. It's just become so accepted that we take it for granted. But uh, could we really clone our pets, our children, ourselves? Well, I think it's not. Uh, generally considered uh, ethical, uh, in part because it hasn't been through 
FDA approval, but for but for deeper reasons than that, um, to do to do human beings, um, and it's not necessary. Moreover, but yes, we, uh, pets are done, uh, and, and agricultural species are done, and, and transplants are done that way. So it, it makes its way into human bodies, but but only uh, via transplants. Explain to me the dire wolf thing. It, what you did was you edited gray wolves to have lots of the DNA and traits of the extinct uh, dire wolf. But are these really dire wolves or are they gray wolves with some of the traits edited in? So the whole species definition uh, is intentionally blurry uh, in, in, in the Endangered Species Act and in uh, all sorts of uh, definitions. Um, it's, it's a mixture of what can breed with what, what can, you know, what has, um, uh, you know, different, different physical traits and so forth. And it also you can, you can literally speciate with as little as one change, but there's millions of changes within a population, millions of differences, say, between you and me, but none of those are species levels differences because I think most people would argue you and I are in the same species. So this is a dire wolf, you would I, say. I think right? this, this is uh, much more recognizable as a dire wolf than any other kind of wolf. Um, we, we also brought back, we also, sorry, did clone a red wolf, uh, uh, which is an endangered species, probably the most rare wolf in, in the world. Um, and that's most certainly a red wolf, uh, even, even though it was quite a different population. As you know better than anybody on the planet, uh, genes can have uh, uh, unintended consequences and effects, including even in this one, with the genes you did to get the gray wolf to have a white coat, could also cause deafness and blindness. Explain that to me. Right. So, the, so this was a, a, a case where we we didn't do it in order to be uh, um, s simple. We we made our life a little more complicated in in order to be kind to the, the first generation of dire wolf. We wanted to make sure we didn't accidentally put in an allele that could cause the kind of sensory uh, problems um, that's been associated with one of these alleles that we found. So we, we did a, a substitute allele. We're looking for functional de-extinction where they can you know, fill a specific, particular ecological niche. Anyway, we chose uh, a, an unnatural allele at that one, but most of the 20 alleles that we changed um, there was no compromise between the health of the of this of the new species or and the um, uh, uh, and the, and the uh, the alleles that we chose. We've talked a lot, you and I, about the woolly mammoth. That's sort of the goal, in some ways, of your de extinction company. Tell me how that's gone. Well, the the, re the real goal of Colossal is developing technology that can be used. Um, Freely by, by for conservation efforts and 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 with with lots of other applications to human health and so forth, uh, the mammoth uh, is um, more challenging because than both the the mouse and the the wolf that we've done because of, those two have very short generation uh, gestation periods, uh, so so as little as twenty days for the mouse, while the elephant is uh, twenty two months. Uh, also because they're endangered species. And one of the things we're trying to do is give them new land. Um, we have, to, we, there's more complexity to getting access to their, the tissues and uh, in the land that they will go on to. Uh, so, so that's, that's, we knew from the beginning that was gonna be slow and that's why we picked other species um, to work, work out our technology and, and show the world that we, uh, you know, are semi-competent. Let me ask you the Jurassic Park question, which is, what could go wrong reintroducing species like this into the wild? And is there some regulation or self-regulation? Oh, uh, there's plenty of regulation. So, uh, and this applies to the pigs that I referred to as well as the, the FDA um, regulates uh, sa safety and efficacy, both for the animal and, and in, uh, if in the case of transplants for the human being, there's, there's a lot of regulations there. There's the Environmental Protection Agency and their equivalents in other countries, um, and that's and there should be. I, I'm, 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 we're we're, we're uh, delighted to be working with this. There's also uh, considerations of um, 
you know, uh, local populations, indigenous people. I, th I think we have a lot of support there, but we're, we're not rushing into this. We're not moving them on, uh, on the, um, you know, public land until we've had a, a very broad conversation and consensus. What would happen if the dire wolves that you've uh, sort of recreated just went out into the wild someday? Would everything be all right, or could there be a problem? Uh, again, I wouldn't rush to do that. Uh, I, I, uh, we uh, right right now they would probably be capable of breeding with a variety of other species, what are called species, uh, but but. Um, species, like I said, is a broad term, and, it, and there's not sharp edges to the to the breeding. We could make them so that they don't interbreed. Um, we could even make them so they couldn't leave the uh, the enclosure that they're in, which is now t 2,000 acres, which is quite generous. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it remains to be seen what could go wrong. I, I, just because we can't think of something right at this minute doesn't doesn't mean we stop looking for um, and, and in engaging all kinds of ecologists and developmental biologists and and so forth to, to, to think out of the box as to what could go wrong um, before we do it. Your company that you co-founded has a $10 billion or more valuation. Uh, explain to me uh, what is the revenue stream? What do you envision? Uh, I think that, that from the beginning that the, the what the investors were looking for uh, and and uh, was uh, new technologies. Uh, and if, in fact, that's already happening. We've spun off FormBio, uh, which is a computational biology company, which has been v v instrumental in all the things that we've been talking about today in this conversation. Uh, we've also, in the process of making uh, uh, gametes, uh, we've, we've, we've spun off a... Uh, a, a, a product is, it is the first uh, FDA-approved phase three trial for an IPS-derived uh, cell. I mean, the, the jargon there, sorry, is that is IPS is a very important sor source of stem cells that is making its way into multiple medical products. This one jumped to the front of the line um, in enabling maturation of eggs in IVF clinics. So that's, that's something that we had uh, both uh, veterinary and uh, human use, and there'll be, there'll, there'll be many more, I'm sure. When you and I last spoke on this show about five or six years ago, you talked about artificial intelligence being important in what you're going to do. Explain how that was relevant here and what you're doing with it. Well, so, so back then it was just uh, beginning to, to show that it, uh, its value. I mean, I think a lot of people had, had seen it coming, and a lot of people hadn't. Um, but today, it's, it's undeniable, and I think one of the major applications of AI, even more amazing than, than art and language, uh, I think, is uh, its application to protein design. Um, this was recognized in this year's um, uh, uh, Nobel Prizes, um, and uh, in particular, my good friend and colleague David Baker uh, has been doing this. And uh, five of my recent startups uh, use, have used it routinely uh, in combination with large libraries. Um, uh, and, 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 and we're using it essentially everywhere now for, for, for diagnostics, for therapeutics, for um, the kind of uh, work that we've been describing here on wild animals. It, it uh, really is very helpful. I mean, so far, it, it, it's, it definitely, depends heavily on collaboration with humans and the creativity and out-of-the-box thinking and perspective and ethics of humans. But uh, it's, it's, it's tremendous a time to be a scientist. Uh, you've spoken about using gene editing tools you've pioneered, including CRISPR, base editing, the things we talked about that David Liu just won the Breakthrough Prize for. In order to recreate uh, extinct species, could you create new species, ones that never existed before? Would that be a good idea? Uh, you asked, I mean, two questions. Could you and is it a good idea? I, I think it, it could be uh, done, it's technically, and it could be a good idea if you want to have a species that has a particular niche, but you, but you, 
but you want it to immediately not interbreed with another species. Um, and I think that, that that could be very easily done, and it's one of the, the, the research projects in my lab is to figure out uh, how to do that in a in, a, in as humane a pot way as possible. Give me an example of what you're thinking about in the well, lab. Well, so there, there are uh, a few examples uh, of um, where you can get speciation with a single mutation. Um, for example, the chirality of snails uh, causes speciation and multiple, it's been observed multiple times. Uh, you can get uh, uh, inability to produce fertile offspring if you have um, multiple uh, um, reciprocal translocations in the chromosomes. These are things that allow it to breed with itself, but not with the, not with the species that it, that it uh, came out of. So um, those are two, two examples, uh, but there are many more. Um, behavioral changes can happen with single mutations and, and so forth. How many companies, by the way, have you co-founded? I've uh, co-founded uh, 50, um, 49 or 50, and it's, uh, I've helped with a few, quite a few more. By co-founding that many companies, you're sort of the poster child for why American science has been so innovative and entrepreneurial ever since the end of World War II, which is there's a funding of basic research at universities, and the people who do it find ways to translate that from the bench and the lab to the bedside of a patient, for example, and to turn them into companies. Are you worried that the cuts in federal support for basic research is going to end that 70-year uh, boon that we've had in the United States? Well, I worry about everything. Uh, I think in this particular case, I, I, I read something recently today uh, that there is a, a proposal for $15 billion for biotech, specifically so can, we can be competitive internationally. Um, I don't know whether that will arrive or not and whether it will sufficiently support basic science, but I, I completely agree with, with, I think, what you're saying is that uh, basic science has been important to almost well, essentially everything that, that we've been talking about here and many others. Um, and, and, and increasingly, it goes very quickly from basic science to, um, to applications, although it doesn't need to. I think we need to be flexible in our support of this. But it, it's inspiring, uh, you know, no matter how dire, sorry to use the word, uh, um, the uh, economic reports can be to see that, you know, new breakthroughs uh, having impact on, on health care and, and other aspects of our life is, uh, I think, gives us new hope. George Church, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, thank you.